All of what I'm talking about is from the American point of view. We are not inventing a whole new body of law. We've got a really great framework, at least built on common law and everything else, which allows us to just adapt what we've got to existing scenarios. And what I mean by this is everybody says, what happens if an autonomous car or a person jumps in front of an autonomous car? Uh, what happens in this trolley paradox scenario? What happens if somebody uses an autonomous vehicle to drive through a crowd of pedestrians or to deliver a bomb somewhere? I mean. These aren't new questions. We've been asking these questions since the beginning of time, the minute we had a, a wheel that could turn and carry something from A to B. So these aren't new questions. Um, what is interesting, and, and I'll get to those specific examples in a moment just to, to prove my point, but to begin with, what, what is really interesting though is we are gonna have some new definitions, right? So liability generally, and just sort of thinking out loud so one can imagine that we're gonna need at least four different types of, well, definitions, right? So. You're going to hear me throughout the course of the evening referring a lot to the aviation world. I'm a hopeless aviation fanatic as well. You know, we, we no longer use the terms pilot and co-pilot or even captain and first officer. Rather, we use the terminology, the PF and the PNF. So the pilot flying and the pilot not flying. And so it seems pretty logical then that when we have autonomous vehicles, we're going to end up with something rather like this. An owner driver, uh, an owner non-driver, a non-owner driver, and the non-owner, non-driver, which is, of course, the perfect passenger. And the reason why this matters is because, well, it, it sounds silly. Somebody's laughing here. I don't know why, but, it, but, but, but here's why it matters, right? Because everyone talks about this liability question, like, well, what happens if an autonomous car hits somebody or something? Well, I don't know. If they're not driving and they don't own the car, how can they be liable for anything? I mean, you're not liable as a passenger sitting in an airplane, right? So ultimately what's going to happen is we're just going to do what we do in aviation. We're going to go down through the entire chain of potential liability until we find the source. A great example of this that I love, and by the way, as an aside, this is why aviation is so incredibly safe. I've often said that an aircraft at cruising, cruising altitude is the safest place a human can be in the globe on the globe, above the globe, whatever. Um, and this is amazing because one of the cool metrics you've all heard, I'm sure, is you know the mean time till failure for some thing. Well, the mean time to failure for a twin engine aircraft, both engines failing, is so vanishingly small, you can't even get a meaningful number out of it. I mean, these things are essentially, for lack of a better word, over-engineered bits of perfection. It's incredible. Um, nevertheless, there was a British Airways crash several years ago at Heathrow. Some of you might remember this. Uh, the issue was that there was some frozen fuel delivery system. And the question, of course, was well, what went wrong? Well, obviously, as they should have done, they first looked to the pilots. There was nothing wrong there, so they went through all the various systems. They even were able to trace the fuel back, not just to the airport where they filled up the plane, all the way back to the oil refinery itself that produced the fuel. I mean, that's just cool. Well, as it turns out, that wasn't the issue. There was a mechanical failure in the plane. That's not the point. What is the point is that we can learn a lot from aviation and that's why these definitions matter a lot. So let's touch really briefly. I'm not gonna give you a crash course in first year law school, but look, these are really basic things in everyday life. Negligence, intentional torts, criminal acts, just running through them very quickly. I'm sure there's very familiar, similar things here in Germany and elsewhere. Besides, so for negligence, you just have to show that there was some duty that a reasonable person breached and that it actually caused the harm. There's a cool tangential thing called the emergency doctrine. If somebody did something out of an emergency situation, we say that that was probably okay. The textbook case is that a passenger in a taxi pulled a gun on the driver. The driver drove the car up onto the sidewalk into a brick wall. I think may have injured a pedestrian. That's not the point. The point was, would a reasonable person have done that sort of a thing? Would they have driven into a wall if a gun was pointed at their head? Well, yeah, the court said, that's pretty reasonable. It's called a panic reaction. So you look at that, you look at intentional torts, that somebody use an autonomous vehicle to injured somebody or you trespassed on property. That's a fun one because it turns out, at least in American law, the intentional tort of trespass doesn't even require the knowledge that you were entering onto somebody else's property. Merely the intent to enter onto some property generally, and then that it happened to belong to somebody else, oh well, too bad for you. And so this raises the really interesting question, 
you know, so you've got an autonomous vehicle, it's level five. What happens if it turns around on somebody else's property? Well, who's liable? Is it the manufacturer of the vehicle? Is it the, the passenger who doesn't even own the car who programmed it? Is it the software company, the camera, the LiDAR company? These are the questions to be asking, not whether we can do it, but rather how to do it.